good evening members welcome to the study circle meeting for section 194r of income tax act and the gst interplay relating to it today we have two eminent speaker ca narendra kumar j jain and hanish s i request our chairman of the branch to escort the speakers onto the dais and hand them over with the floral bouquet now i request our chairman to give a welcome address c a narendra jain sir ms c a hanish pramod and my dear professional colleagues happy evening to you all happy evening very cold na i welcome you all for this very interesting uh, session on 194 as you all know it is like a double edged sword it cuts in income tax as well as gst that's why we want to have two faculties two specialist when we requested narendra sir and hanish immediately they agreed even they their tight schedule I thank you for that sir i welcome you once again and uh, there is lot of implication both even in income tax and gst and effective from 1st july but yet to know so many internal points uh, how it uh, affects in a day to day professional journey to speak on that we have two eminent speakers even i am also eager to listen uh, thank you and once again welcome you all for this uh, session and uh, one more note i want to bring it, bring it to you all that on august 19th and 20th we have a state level conference in palace ground anantya request all the members to register for this thank you thank you chairman i would like to take the privilege in introducing today's speakers firstly mr c n narendra kumar jain who is an advocate a commerce graduate and a fellow chartered accountant who is also a company secretary and holds a bachelor degree in law narendra has experience over 17 years in advising clients and handling tax litigation in income tax transfer pricing corporate tax international taxation and gst His academic distinctions include All India fifth rank in CS Inter, DL Mazumdar Silver Medical for securing the highest marks in advanced company law practice, Taxman Prize Award for securing highest marks in direct and indirect taxation law in CS Final, and Mrs. Pankajan Rangachari SISC Prize Award for securing the highest marks in advanced company law and practice in CS Final. He has authored and co-authored following books. Authored book. includes analysis of transfer pricing judgments published by cch co-authored book on digital commerce and analysis of taxation aspects and emerging issues published by ifa bangalore sub chapter co-authored book on permanent establishment emerging trends published by ctc and taxman co-authored book new age assessment penalties and appeals published by kca he is a regular speaker at various conferences workshops study circles his teaching stints include teaching for ca final students at caps on direct taxes international taxation and transfer pricing from 2004 to 2018 and for ca final students at icai bangalore branch mr narendra was conveyor of bangalore sub group of chamber of tax consultants mumbai for 1920 and treasurer for international fiscal association bangalore sub chapter from 2018 to 2020 i welcome you once again i would also like briefly introduce mr c a hanish s who has completed his uh, chartered accountancy course in 2008 and also completed company secretary llb and bcom he is a practicing as a chartered accountant from last 7 years and specializes in indirect taxation he is a regular speaker at various forums of indirect taxation i welcome you mr hanish as well
with this i think i would like to present to you all to the two eminent speakers of the day so i would like to leave you guys to them over to you respected seniors in profession and dear friends good evening i would like to start with thanking uh, chairman sir and bangalore branch for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts on this interesting subject and uh, in the process the learning i have had in last two weeks preparing for this session is what i'll speak is only a part of that every budget tinkers with the tds provision as if the revenue authorities have a deep love for tds provisions they just cannot survive without making changes in the tds provision in every budget some changes have drastic impact like 194r there may be changes which are small but this one particular provision is going to impact the way people do their business it is not just restricted to what the objective the finance minister stated that we want to collect information of people who are getting benefit or have bring the benefit and perquisite within the tax net but it is its impact will be felt on the regular conduct of the business by the assessees the problems are compounded by the guidelines which the board had power to give which also have interesting set of raises new interesting issues and at some point of time it also tries to broaden the framework of 194r itself so from where it started in the finance minister's speech and where it ends in the circular is makes already the small journey very interesting sometimes you feel happy about these kind of a provisions because they'll generate so much of professional work that i don't have to worry about marketing but that happiness is momentary because the kind of provision it is and the sadness it brings that the way it impacts the business lives with you every day so what i have done is first i will will look at the basic provisions then we'll go into issues certain issues we can't cover entire aspects maybe last in 15 minutes we can leave it for questions and what are my views on way the circular has come about so just let's start with the rational for introduction as we all know there is a provision of 284 which not clear so it provided that if there is a benefit of perquisite which is arising from business it will be taxable this is a provision which is there in statute book from law there is no quarrel about this particular provision that if the assess is in, engaged in the business or profession and there is a benefit or perquisite arising from that business then it is taxable <laughs> There has been good amount of litigation on the this particular provision itself right up to Supreme Court in Mahindra and Mahindra's case. So possibly taking clue from this particular provision, the finance minister stated that it has been noticed that as a business promotion strategy, there is a tendency on businesses to pass on benefits to their agents. Such benefits are taxable in the hands of agents. Now look at this, in order to track such transactions, so primary objective the finance minister says in order to track such transaction I propose to provide tax deduction for by the person giving benefits if the aggregate value of such benefit exceeds 20,000 rupees during the financial year. Further the memorandum connects this to 28.4. Section 28.4 provides the value of benefit or perquisites whether convertible into money or not arising from business or exercise of profession 
is to be charged as a business income in the hands of recipient right in many cases such recipients do not report such transactions basically they want to capture it so this is from where the objective starts that there is a benefit perquisite it is not being tracked we want to track it then there is 28.4 which is not getting taxed we want to tax it with that objective this provision has been inserted we'll just have a quick look at the section i, I presume everyone has read it so then we will go into the issues so subsection one says that the benefit of perquisites provided to a resident so it has to be provided to a resident whether convertible into money or not arising from exercise of arising from business or exercise of profession by such resident shall before providing the benefit of perquisites so keep you look at the phrases here the timing of deduction is not given at the time of credit or payment right generally that is a tedious provision so here it says before providing such benefit or perquisite how much before they have not stated immediately before one month before two months before six months before we don't know so before providing such benefit of perquisite has the case may be to such a resident ensure that tax has been deducted it doesn't say deduct tax it says ensure that tax has been deducted ideally all our tedious provision says you deduct tax ensure that tax has been deducted has been used in only two provisions one related to lot lottery and one related to virtual digital asset so now this is the third provision which uses the word ensure that tax has been deducted in respect of such benefit or perquisite at the rate of 10 percent on the value or aggregate of such value again the deduction is on the value whereas in all other sections the deduction is on the sum or income or payment right because you have a quantified payment there here it is on a value not on the payment second proviso says that if sorry first proviso says that if the payment is in kind or partly in kind and partly in cash and the cash portion is not sufficient to capture the tedious amount is not sufficient to to the extent of tedious amount then the person responsible for providing such benefit or perquisites before releasing the benefit or perquisite ensure that tax is required to be deducted has been paid so if the perquisite or benefit is in kind then the person who is providing this benefit or perquisite before releasing that benefit or perquisite he has to ensure that the tax required to be deducted has been paid okay in respect of the benefit or perquisite subsections 2 subsection 3 provide for issue of guidelines subsection 2 says if to remove any difficulties so if there is any difficulty and the board wants to remove any difficulty the board can issue the guidelines now for in that the power which is given in subsection 2 has been used to issue circular 12 of 22 to remove the difficulty but as we will see instead of removing difficulty it creates more difficulty subsection 3 they provides that you will keep table these guidelines in the uh, parliament and the guidelines look at the words shall be binding on income tax authorities and person providing such benefit or perquisite now there are three persons income tax authority person providing the benefit person getting the benefit right so in the guidelines now it says it is binding on income tax authorities that was always understood but it is also binding on person who is providing the benefit so that means the person who is deducting tds who is liable to deduct tds under these sections now the can he go against this circular see always what has happened is a circular which is issued by under 119 we have said is not binding on the assc it is binding on the income tax authority is not binding on the courts and the assc that has been the settled position that all of us have understood but this particular section because those circulars which are issued in 119 but here a specific power has been given in 194r itself and the guidelines are issued under 194r subsection 2 and subsection 3 now this particular provision says are binding on the person who is providing the benefit so therefore when a person who is providing the benefit the way he looks at these guidelines will be different because he says it is binding on me the lens with which you look at these guidelines as a deductor will be completely different and as a recipient of the benefit it will be completely different because in the mind of deductor otherwise i have a disallowance issue penalty issues interest issues so i am bound by these guidelines i will follow these guidelines 
Whereas the person who is receiving it may have a different thought process that where is the benefit I have got? If I have not got a benefit under 28.4, it is not taxable. Therefore, whether I should follow these guidelines. The guidelines are made binding on the person who is providing, not on the person who is receiving. So from the perspective of the person who is receiving, he can still say circular is not binding on me and I have to still satisfy the test and framework of 28.4 and if it falls in the 28.4 or any other provision where it is taxable, then only it should be taxed. Whereas the person who is deducting, for him, he will say that I will have to follow these guidelines, I will clearly follow these guidelines, I will not go beyond these guidelines. So there, to that extent, there will be an issue and difference of opinion always with respect to this particular guidelines. <laughs> Second, these guidelines are for the purpose of removing difficulty. But if you see the guidelines, they place interpretation. So when the board had only got power to remove difficulty, can they say that I will interpret this provision, this is meant to be so and so, that is something which will be open to challenge in the courts. But as a deductor, one should not worry about that challenge because you just follow this and deduct it. But as a recipient, someone will possibly come and challenge saying that a circular which is meant, a power which has been given to remove difficulty, can you expand the scope of provision? And you will see that the board is trying to expand the scope of provisions in the circular. Therefore, to that extent, where the circular tries and expands the scope of provisions because you can't interpret in this particular guidelines and you cannot expand the scope of this provision to that extent yes these guidelines could be open to challenge but that is for a different day and different discussion currently we are looking at that what would be the basic framework within which we should understand these provisions just broadly tabulated this just a couple of two to three more points then we'll go into the issues. The rate is 10%. Please keep it in mind that section 197 is not amended. So the recipient cannot apply for lower deduction and for the purpose of 194R. So there is no amendment to 197. Ideally, they should have made an amendment to 197 and added 194R there. So the recipient could make an application that give me lower deduction certificate. That has not been done. Till that has not been done, there opportunity to give 15G, 15H or get a lower deduction certificate is not available. Flat 10% deduction, you have to do it. That is one. Hey, HUF and individuals, the standard exclusion of turnover limits is avail applicable here that one can take the benefit. Effective date is 1st July. So that is what we have to see. And threshold limit is 20,000 rupees. So 20,000 per annum, if your benefit perquisite exceeds this 20,000 rupees, then the applicability will come. So for understanding 194R, these are certain important issues, which we will discuss in this detail. And what is the board's in interpretation of these particular issues? So first issue is obligation is on a person who is providing any benefit or perquisites, whether convertible into money or not. So who is person responsible, who is what is providing and what is a benefit or perquisite? What do you mean by whether convertible into money or not? These are the issues which arise from the first point. The benefit and perquisite should be provided to a resident. The benefit or perquisite should arise from business or exercise of a profession. Obligation is to ensure tax has been deducted, not deduct tax, but ensure tax has been deducted and obligation is to be fulfilled before providing such benefit or perquisite. So these are the five broad important aspects that we should understand to understand 194R. Any person responsible for providing, person responsible idly is been defined in 204 for the TDS provisions that who is a person who is responsible because the liability to deduct TDS is on the person responsible and person responsible is the person who should deduct TDS. So that has been defined in 204 that who is a person responsible. But in context of 194R, an explanation below 194R itself defines who is a person responsible. So for the purpose of 194R, you did not go to 204. The explanation says that person who is providing the benefit of perquisite and if it is a company, including the company itself or the principal officer will be the person responsible for detecting. Brought in line with 204, but they have made it more specific that who is providing, he only has to detect. For example, if you have, you do a, uh, give a benefit of travel to a foreign country to a dealers to your dealers and the agent may be providing the end service 
So he must be taking the people, but he is not the person who is providing the benefit. The person who is providing such benefit. So the company who is hired that particular travel agent will be the person who is responsible for the deducting the TDS. The first issue that we need to address is should we connect this to 28.4? Because as we saw in the memorandum and in the finance minister's speech, they were referring to 28.4. So the reference was to 28.4. So this question was raised to the board and board has in question one of the circular 12 of 2012, sorry, 2022 has made a statement that deductor need not check is required to check whether the amount of benefit or perquisite that he is providing would be taxable in the hands of recipient under section 284. There is no further requirement to check whether the amount is taxable in the hands of recipient or under which section it is taxable. So clearly the circular disconnects it from 284. So the memorandum said that we are linking it to 284 and there are 284 items we want to bring it into the tax net. But the circular 12 clearly says that you need not look at 284. They also go on to say that there could be items which could be taxable in 41. It could be taxable in other provisions. Therefore, the as a deductor, you don't look at the taxability in the hands of recipient. If it is a benefit or purpose, deduct TDS. You don't worry about whether that income is taxable in the hands of recipient or not. So clearly, they try to disconnect this with 28.4. Clearly, they try to disconnect this with 28.4. This also could be based on the literal reading because Section per se 194 R per se does not make any reference to 284. 194 R per se doesn't say benefit or perquisite has provided in 284. There is no reference to 284 in 194 R. Only thing is the words used are exactly same. Benefit or perquisites, whether convertible into money or not. This is the same phrase used in 284 as well as 194 R. And there, given that there was the reference in the FM speech as well as memorandum of 28.4. Initially, all of us had interpreted and understood this that it should be restricted to items falling within 28.4. Because if you apply mischief rule or Hayden's rule, they have said there is a mischief that these incomes are not getting taxable and therefore we want to plug that mischief and therefore we are bringing these provisions. Anyway, that could be one way of interpreting it saying that always look at 28.4 and if an item is taxable in 28.4 then only you say TDS is applicable. But from the deductor's perspective, he will say look section does not make reference to 28.4. The circular very clearly says it is not something which we should look at. So therefore the, from a deductor's perspective, he is going to say if the test of benefit or perquisite whether convertible into money is satisfied, in those contexts I will deduct TDS. This could also be possibly correct. For the reason that if you look at all the TDS provisions, and this is what also board has referred in subsection uh, in the question one, that if you look at other TDS provisions, if whether professional income is taxable in the hands of recipient, I as a deductor don't see it. Whether the contract charges, rent, commission, whether it is taxable in the hands of the recipient, I as a deductor do not really go and analyze whether it is taxable in the hands of recipient. I will say if the character of payment is so and so, I will deduct TDS except cases like 195 which specifically uses the fair chargeable under the any some chargeable under that act so their specific phrase has been used that it should be chargeable under the act given that no such phrase has been used in 194r further 284 has been not been specifically referred in 194r from a deductor's perspective it is going to be difficult to argue that if it is not 284 i will not deduct tds so possibly in my opinion from a deductor's perspective where the test of benefit or perquisite, whether convertible into money or not, is satisfied. In those cases, you should deduct TDS. Let's look at what do you mean by providing. And when do you say that benefit or perquisite is provided? Now, we have some judicial decision in the context of different provisions to 24.4 in the context of 28.4, there the words have been understood. What do you mean by provided? The Delhi High Court in Bawa Singh Chauhan's case, the word provided means making it available for the use of the assessee. Whether the assessee actually uses them or not is irrelevant. Templeton's case, 
it has been held that no benefit is provided until the benefit in question becomes available to be enjoyed by the taxpayer in respect of which a charge to tax can arise. So there is a person who is providing the benefit and that benefit is provided when it becomes available to the recipient for use. This becomes very important because the timing has been discussed. There is no specific timing in this particular section. So there it will help us to understand that when do you say something has been provided because the liability to deduct TDS would arise at that point of time before providing it will arise before providing it will arise. Therefore, we'll have to understand this in an, that context. Every benefit or perquisite will have different context because if you have to give a tangible item like a gold coin, right? Now a company wants to give it to a distributor. When do you say he is provided? When he has handed over that gold coin to the distributor. But when it comes to say travel coupons, you want to take him to a foreign trip. Now when do you say that it has been provided? Do you say when he actually goes it has been provided or a step before that? For example, in a foreign trip, there could possibly these steps, give and take one or two steps, maybe up or more, less or more. So first is there is a scheme which has been framed, right? Now the scheme would say that if you achieve so and so targets or based on so and so parameters, I am going to take to so and so destination. So on 31st March, the manufacturer FMCG company, for example, would analyze the efforts done by the distributors and based on that, he will say that, okay, 10 distributors are eligible for this benefit or 15 distributors are eligible for this benefit. So possibly he will pass and make a provision in his books of account. Now applying matching concept, if I take 31.3.23, then I have to make a provision in my books of account that because it is an expense incurred to promote the sale which has happened in the current year, right? So I will pass and provision entry in my books of account that 15 distributors have satisfied these conditions. They have achieved so and so sale. That sale has been accounted in this year. Therefore, against this, I am incurring say 5 lakh rupees per distributor, 75 lakh rupees. I'm making a provision. Let's assume that's the first step. Second step may be or may not be there. I've just put it. The dealer distributor intimates the foreign destination. Suppose the scheme said we are giving you three destinations. You can select one destination. The schemes could be different where someone will say I will going you to take to Mauritius. There is no choice of a destination also. That could be second step. Then the company makes a payment to a tour operator and books the makes the relevant arrangements that these are the tickets, these are the hotel and he makes these arrangements. This is the third step. There's a C here is a place where the company has incurred the expenditure. Now just look at it. We are talking of provided. You have to provide the benefit. The step C is where the person has incurred the expenditure. Fourth, when the tickets are handed over to him by email or whatever mechanism it could be, you give it to that dealer that look, these are your tickets. These are hotel stay. These are the coupons, bill, etc. And this is how you have to go. Suppose he does this activity in May or June and the tour is planned on July. So the July dealer uses, avails this benefit. He avails this benefit, goes to that particular destination and comes back. When he comes back, the benefit or perquisite is completed, right? So these are now various steps which are there in this particular example. Naturally, this will change depending on every benefit or perquisite. If it is a gold coin, it is, I'll make a provision. I'll buy the gold coins. I'll hand over the gold coins, right? Now, it could be a very different thing in every benefit or perquisite that naturally needs to be analyzed in each cases. The question is, when do you say that benefit has been provided? Because that effectively impacts our timing of deduction because before providing you should deduct it. Yes. So will it be step A? Step A is provision. It cannot be step A, right? It cannot be step A because it's just a mere provision entry. The next question is arises if it is not step A and you don't deduct TDS at step A, whether that provision will become deductible expenditure in the hands of that particular company. Now suppose there's an FMCG company which has now made a provision on 31.3.23 that 75 lakh rupees I will incur on foreign trial. It has made a provision. Will this provision be deductible expenditure? Prior to this particular provision coming into picture, this was accepted that it is a deductible expenditure. We had the Bombay High Court in Maharashtra hybrid seats, 133taxman.com43. They said, up, you look, you have got the sales, you have made a provision, you have identified it. 
no doubt it is something which is there but applying the principles of matching concept applying the general principles when you make a provision the liability is ascertained because you have made a scheme and you have bound to take so and so distributors to foreign location so you have made a provision so liability is ascertained liability it is not an unascertained liability quantification may get delayed because it will be when you really take that person to that foreign destinations but that may suddenly change now because 194 r the way you interpret 194 r that you have provided and you have made a provision 194 r says provided it doesn't say provision here it is provision so this this difference will remain now once you claim deduction in say in my example ay 23 24 and benefit is provided in next assessment year the assessing officer is bound to start jumping it is going bound to disallow your expenditure that difficulty will remain right second step he just intimates it possibly it is not provided third step when he incurs the expenditure really incurs the expenditure say in june he books makes all the arrangement makes a payment to the travel agent can you say he has provided or he has incurred he has just incurred right you can't say it is provided because our earlier discussions of these two decisions it should be made available to use that means it should reach the recipient for using the benefit unless it reaches the recipient for using the benefit how do you say it has been provided to the recipient so in my opinion also the c is something which it has incurred the expenditure but not provided right but d would be a a situation where you can say that the the tickets have been given to the concerned person and therefore that could be the situation where the benefit has been provided for some reason he does not travel then what happens corona or xyz for personal reasons then what happens he's not using it but tds obligation is not on use what does it say if you provide you deduct it doesn't say you deduct when he avails it right so that again will become a problem because for xyz reason really this particular tour may not happen it could be certain geopolitical issues or it could be some corona like situation where you are not able to enjoy this benefit or the concerned person may change his mind that i have already gone to this destination i don't want to go you give me 50 percent cash so there could be n number of circumstances where in which this particular provision may really not be used by the assessees but given the language in 194R, which says once you have provided the benefit, you deduct TDS, the same, if you we, if we read it in that sense, once the TDS is deducted, you can't get a refund of that. In the hands of recipient, it may not be taxable. That's a different issue. But from the deductor's perspective, person who is providing, providing there the liability has arisen. This analogy we can apply to other provisions also. For example, I get a bill for professional fees and I account it in my books of account. Later on, I don't pay him, but when I have accounted whether TDS is applicable or not, credit or payment, whichever is earlier. So possibly the way the section reads, there it is be going to be difficult to say that subsequently if it is canceled, then TDS is not applicable because the timing of deduction is before providing. Now, before providing, next issue is how much before? Should I do at the stage of A, B, C, or D? Now, D is where the condition is really satisfied. It is not before this. The obligation under 194R arises in my example at stage D. Nothing beyond, nothing before that, nothing prior to that, right? So, any time before that, in my opinion, should be good enough. If, if the person wants to keep better control possibly we should link it to c because when you incur and that cash outflow is happening or when you are passing the entries in the books of account that could be point of control from a control perspective that could be a timing when one should uh, look at looking at 194r because that also will be point where you will be really able to quantify not at the stage one or stage two because that time you may really not be able to quantify the liability of individual recipients so that this is something which we need to be aware of. This also can be more complicated. For example, you provide benefit every month, accommodation provided every month. So how do you then deduct TDS? Do you say month on month I will deduct? Suppose you have provided an rent free accommodation to some of your consultant. 
and it is falling within 194 R. Right now it is a benefit or perquisite to him. So do you say that I will detect at the end of every month when I make the rent payment or in the beginning where you have entered into rental agreement that I will give you this accommodation for three months, six months, 12 months. So you have provided in the beginning only or you are providing every month. Again, these are practical issues. Ideal situation would be to detect monthly. So when you make the rent payment, you do two TDS deductions. One on the rent 194i, which will be one payment because 194i may get attracted. Second could be 194r because at the same benefit now there are two different recipients. So it is though it is a single payment to TDS liability, but because the recipients are two different people, there is no overlap here. There is no overlap here. What are the cases of overlap? I'll come subsequently. But when you are this kind of a situations could be there, single payment could attract two TDS liability. So this is something which you'll have to be aware of the timing. When do you determine that the benefit or perquisite has been provided and that will be the timing before that providing you have to detect TDS. Just to put it in a very lighter sense, before you gold, give gold coin, just immediately deduct TDS. Before, right? that's in a lighter sense. In a practical sense, the control should be when you really incur this expenditure, that could be from an accounting perspective, what control you should have could be the point where one could look at deducting TDS. Next is meaning of benefit or perquisite. These are terms which are not defined, but used across act. For example, section 17 uses it, 224, 4 uses it, 28, 4 uses it, fringe benefit tax use the terms. We have a general understanding of benefit of perquisite. I, I thought that I have an understanding of benefit of perquisites. After reading the circular, I, I now can confirm that I don't know what is benefit or perquisite. Because they say reimbursement is a benefit or perquisite, right? So how can a reimbursement be a benefit or perquisite? We will see those examples as we proceed further. But in a general sense, what could be a benefit or perquisite? It is an advantage or gain or a profit. To say in a simpler term, it is an improvement in the condition of a recipient. Recipient's condition has improved a bit. So that is a benefit or perquisite. We have some decisions I have cited here. One can read this and take it there. But I will put it in simple terms that if someone is getting any benefit, advantage, profit or gain, or it is improving his condition in what he was before getting this benefit or before getting this facility or amenity, that could be treated as benefit. Perquisite is generally understood in the context of salary, but we can draw the same analogy and, and apply here, but don't go to section 17 of fringe benefit tax to understand these two terms. Please understand these terms only in the context of the general meaning of these two terms that what could be a benefit and what could be the perquisite. So if you see, it says it could be benefit occurring would be any advantage, gain or improvement in condition. So you can apply this simple logic to say that is benefit or perquisite. The question three of the uh, circular says that whether benefit of perquisite can be in the form of a capital asset. So suppose I'm a dealer and some FMCG company has run a scheme that if you achieve so and so target, I will give you so and so car. So he gives me a car. It is a receipt of a capital asset for me because I may use this particular car in the business or there could be a lot of such schemes. They may give me a refrigerator, which I may put it in my use in the business. So the question was whether the asset received can be treated as a perquisite. Okay. Can be treated as liable for 194 R. Can it be treated as benefit or perquisite? In the context of 28.4, the Supreme Court in Mahindra and Mahindra's case was dealing with waiver of loan, which loan was incurred for acquiring the capital asset. They said waiver of loan incurred for acquiring the capital asset is not a benefit or perquisite which is captured in 28.4. However, there are quite few other decisions. Same again in the context of 28.4, the board relies on those other decisions and comes to a conclusion that receipt of capital asset is liable for 194R. Okay. Just now look at what the recipient happens. What happens to the recipient? Now he receives this capital asset. 
on which now he is liable to pay tax, right? He will deduct it as I'll pay tax on that. What will he do with this asset? Can he say I will capitalize this asset? Can I claim depreciation on this? So can I say I have account it as 100 rupees as income and credit income debit asset and claim depreciation? I have not paid anything for this. You have spent 100 rupees. Now you are paying only 30 rupees as tax. Can you claim depreciation on 100? Your actual outflow is 30. Assuming you are in 30 percent slab or maybe 25 if you are 20 percent, 25 percent slab, right? Your actual outflow is 25. What you go out as tax is 25. Okay. Can it be said it is an actual cost under 43.1? Actual cost is something what you incur. Now the balance here is notional because you have offered it to tax by virtue of a particular provision. Okay. Now again, ideally this kind of a provision was not required to say capital asset should be taxed as uh, income under 28.4 because 43.1 which itself deals with the actual cost. If you say if a cost of an asset is incurred by third party, incurred by someone else, then you don't capitalize it. Suppose I buy a car of 100 rupees, 1 lakh rupees and someone else bears 20, 20, 20,000 rupees of that. What I can capitalize is only 80,000 rupees. I cannot really capitalize it 1 lakh rupees. This happens with subsidies or other things. Wherever we are saying that the cost of an asset is borne by someone else. In that context, I will not capitalize it. Subsidy is also now charged to tax by virtue of 224 amendment. Yeah, but whether that will conflict, if I take it full value, whether that will conflict with the definition of actual cost, which says that cost has been borne by someone else, I will not allow you to capitalize. So this conflict will remain. Two decisions of Supreme Court, Kaluram Govindram, 57 ITR 335, and uh, Goraz Bakrat's case, 116 ITR 7, 125, 116 ITR 125. These two decisions provide for notional deductions. So in one of these cases, in Kaluram's case, sorry, in, uh, in the uh, Gross case, there the raw material cost was borne by someone else. The question was, can I claim that as a deduction while calculating profits and gains of business or profession? These two decisions are in the context of 1922 Act. We have to keep that also in mind. And, but the, still the Supreme Court allowed the deduction for that. And other case was where on partition, the associate got a capital asset and it has not really incurred the cost. But they allowed the deduction for the complete cost. Now 49.1 can cover these kind of a situation. But some principles are laid down in these two decisions that may help the associate to say that if I receive a capital asset on the entire amount if I paid 194R by virtue of 194R it becomes 20, by I paid discharge the entire tax. There could be possibility to say that I will capitalize this and claim depreciation of this. Litigative issue but the associate will have to try out these things. Capital asset per se, whether it is liable for 194R, board has clarified. Here in the beginning I said by virtue of 194R subsection 2 and subsection 3, the person who is providing the benefit, he is for him the guidelines are binding by virtue of subsection 3. And therefore the lens with which he looks these guidelines will be different. From a recipient per perspective, if he can demonstrate that it is a capital receipt which otherwise doesn't fall in 28.4 or 56 to 10 or something else, then he could still claim that it is not taxable. So if I get a capital receipt, the other party may do a 194R, but the recipient can still say that it is not something which is not taxable. It is something which is not taxable in my hand, but then you will have to necessarily apply the test of 28.4 or 56 to 10 or any other provision within which it may fall. If I'm able to demonstrate that within the ambit of income tax law it is not taxable the recipient should still be able to argue it that it is not taxable now esop there is a specific provision where the i the value on which you have paid the tax becomes your cost of acquisition but because there is a specific provision that becomes very easy now here you do not have a specific provision the same thing will happen in your 
other provisions also like notionally taking value for stamp duty purposes but that value can then become your cost of acquisition but those are all specific provisions in the statute unfortunately there is no specific provision for this that if now something on something which you pay tax under 284 that should become a for cost of acquisition for this purpose has not been brought into the statute to that extent the revenue would argue that look there we are giving deduction because there is a specific provision here there is not a specific provision i am not going to you to give you allow you to capitalize it is not your actual cost you have not incurred it therefore i will not allow possibly we'll have to rely on this decision and take the argument forward next controversy is whether convertible into money or not what do you mean by this particular phase the benefit or perquisite whether convertible into money or not as i said in the beginning this phrase is exact copy from 28.4 and in 28.4, the, the Supreme Court in Mahindra and Mahindra has interpreted that it is something other than money. It cannot be in the shape of money. So if it is monetary, then it cannot be whether convertible into money or not. Because it is already converted, what will you further convert that? Right? Because only something which is not in the shape of money, the question of converting that into money will arise. So Supreme Court in the context of 28.4, interpreted to say that these phrase benefit or perquisite whether convertible into money or not will always mean non-monetary benefit or perquisite if it is monetary benefit or perquisites we are not it is not covered in 28.4 now again go back to the discussion what we had just now that whether you will link it to 28.4 or you will delink it to 28.4 question one of the faq question one of the circular says you don't look at 28.4 this is an independent provision and you apply and interpret it independently now if you take that what does the board say? The board says in question two, whether this will apply only to payments, benefit or perquisite, it must be in kind. The board clarifies that it will not cover, it will cover also payment in cash. It will not just restrict it to non-monetary perquisites, even monetary perquisites are covered. Now, how do they interpret that it also covers monetary perquisites? They go back to the proviso what we discussed, the proviso to subsection 1. As I said, first proviso to subsection 1 says that if you provide benefit in kind or you provide it partly in cash and partly in kind and the cash component is not sufficient to capture the TDS amount, in those cases, you have to ensure that tax required to be deducted, last line, last limb of the proviso tax required to be detected has been paid in respect of benefit or perquisite as i said this phraseology comes in two sections one related to lottery and one related to vda it is not used in other any other sections the same in the main limb also where it says that you should ensure that tax has been detected whereas other sections says that tax should be detected the difference between subsection one and proviso to subsection one is subsection uses the words benefit or perquisite whether convertible into money or not now look at the proviso it doesn't use the word convertible to whether convertible to money or not the first limb of sub proviso it says provided that in the case where benefit or perquisite so it doesn't say whether convertible into money or not that phrase is missing in the proviso so does proviso expand the scope of section ideally the function of a proviso is that it should provide exception to the main rule that is a function of a proviso. But here you will see, can you say that the proviso expands the scope of subsection 1? The board has thought it so because they have said that look at proviso, it covers two situations in kind, part in cash, part in kind. Therefore, cash was already covered in subsection 1. And even if you provide benefit or perquisite in cash, you should deduct TDS. I have no problem with that. But the problem is cash components are mostly already covered in other subsections, other sections of TDS. So if I give some cash, it may already be covered in 194C, it may already be covered in 194H or it may be covered in 194J or some other sections. There are so many sections, somewhere it will get covered. Now when this already covered in those sections, was it necessary to extend this to cash perquisites also and especially those perquisites which are entirely in cash so if you give something to your consultant will you not deduct TDS under 194J if you give some incentive uh, to your agent some incentive to your agent or your distributor possibly you will deduct TDS under 194H for them right in those cases when those were already covered in the uh, other sections there was no necessity to bring it into 194R but they have brought it they are saying even cash perquisites are covered in this. Now, once the cash perquisites are covered in this, the challenge will be 
that how to go about this. Now, if I give some has cash perquisite, should I do the TDS under this particular section or will you go to other sections? If the rate of TDS is same, will not be a difficulty, but where rate is less, technical services 2%, 194C 2%, in those cases, they may claim that there is a short deduction of this and therefore we are not giving you the benefit. The idle interpretation of this particular provision, given that the main limb still uses the words benefit or perquisite, whether convertible into money or not, if you say that it is we are restricting, we are also including cash perquisites in this, then you are nullifying or whether convertible into or not. Those words are basically made irrelevant by the interpretation placed by the board. As again said in the beginning, the interpretation, the board's power under 194R2 was to remove difficulty. They didn't have power to interpret the section. They are now interpreting sections and placing a particular interpretation. And then subsection 3 says board, whatever board interprets is binding on the deductor. Right. So to that extent, again, there will be difficulty. But if there is a further clarification on this, it is good. But otherwise, this is going to create a lot of confusion and problems. This is going to create a lot of confusion and problems. Also, why it the, the concept that 194R should apply only to perquisites or benefits given in kind is that 194R1 uses the word value. If it was cash, they would have used the word income or sum. Now you have to deduct TDS on the value of benefit or perquisite, right? Now value will only be for items which are in kind. For money, you can't have different value. It is what it is. Right? So all other sections uses the word sum or income. So some sections uses sum, some sections uses income, but value is used only on this particular section. Right? Therefore, in that context, given the phraseology of subsection one, benefit or perquisite, whether convertible into our money or not, deduct TDS on value. And the most important phrase they've used is ensure that tax has been deducted. If I make a payment, what is there to ensure? I will deduct, right? Now, what does it subsection one says? What does subsection one says? You see the last, uh, before providing, second line onwards, before providing such benefit or perquisites, has the case maybe, ensure that tax has been deducted. Tax deduction means you are paying something out of that you deduct. That is tax deduction. That is any deduction that you reduce. If you are giving 100, you reduce from that. Why have they used word ensure that tax has been deducted? Because if you give something in kind, you can't deduct. If you give a car, you cannot remove the tire and pay TDS, right? You have to ensure that tax has been deducted. So therefore, because of these three phraseologies, value or benefit convertible into money or not, ensure that tax has been deducted, deduct TDS on the value. In my opinion, it should be restricted to perquisites in kind that would I believe is a proper interpretation of subsection one. If we extend this to monetary perquisite, it will create chaos because there will be conflict between different sections. Circular 720 way back in issued in 1995 very clearly said that there can be only one TDS deduction section. There cannot be two TDS deduction sections. Sections are mutually exclusive. You apply TDS under one provision, not under two provisions. So that circular 720 should still support the view that where there is one section which is already covering, this being more general in nature, I should be able to say that TDS should be detected in those sections. Anyway, these are all issues which will arise. One has to be aware of the challenges, right? Yeah, please, please. Yeah, yeah. No, no, that gets linked to your rule because once you have detected, none of the sections says. No, no, I'll, I'll, I'll explain the difference. I'll explain the difference. So if you see other sections also, 194C, 194J, all that says is deduct. Those sections also don't say deduct and pay. If you see any of the sections, because once you have detected, rules come into picture and rule will give that these are the time frames within you should remit. The remittance is always covered in the rule. Now, why the proviso is slightly differently worded? Because in, in, in the context of perquisites which are given in kind, you can't deduct and pay, right? 
as i gave an example if you give a car you can't say i will remove tire and engine and remit it to tds right i have to ensure that tax has been deducted the same phraseology is used in lottery winnings 194b and vda 194s in those context what the courts have had karnataka high court in hindustan lever limiteds case has said that this phrase ensure that tax has to be paid so when he uses this last in the last limb of a proviso ensure that tax required to be deducted has been paid now either you can pay it yourself or you can ask the recipient that you pay it but i will ensure that he has paid it before giving the gold coin so i am going to his shop give him a gold coin pehle advance tax bharo give the chalan to me then i will give you the gold coin just in a uh, practical situation ha huh, tax required to be deducted the tax which is required to be deducted in subsection 1 which is 10% of value see if they are not said required to be deducted then it would have been further difficult because this income is taxable at 30% that means he has to pay advance tax at 30% which is the either paid to deductor either paid himself through advance tax there is a clarification on this in question 9 of circular i will come to that but basically what they are saying is what you have to ensure is either you pay it gross it up and pay it or ask him to pay by advance tax take that chalan and report it in 26q they have amended 26q also to say that you will give the chalan details for the advance this thing that leads to another set of complications because when he will pay advance tax i have to deduct monthly he has to pay advance tax quarterly so that is another set of problem but the 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 purpose of this last limb of the proviso is that you either you pay it yourself or you ensure that other person pays humko tax chahiye whoever pays we are not bothered yeah 7th 7th of 7th uh, of september normal rules normal rules there the normal rules will apply but the problem is you can't deduct out of this car so if you say that the recipient has to pay advance tax that means he has to pay advance tax in august and give you the chalan and that chalan should be reported as a part of your 26q is there is a clarification on this in question 9 we'll we'll see that we'll discuss it further when we go there okay next is arising from benefit or perquisite should arise from business or exercise of profession it should arise from business or profession if it doesn't arise from business or profession it is not taxable arise has discussed in other uh, has in the context of various decisions means spring up originate come into being etc there are two decisions in agra china manufacturing and uh, udavali constructions these are in the context of 284 and in the context of two subsection 24 244 where the benefit of perquisite is provided to directors in that context it is so basically the crux of these decisions is there should be nexus link to business suppose i am doing uh, uh, i am exercising profession i am into profession and i am doing particular consulting for the client as a part of his client is happy with my services though it has never happened that he gives me something extra so instead of giving professional fees he also gives me say an iphone right never happened but i'm just giving an hypothetical situation <laughs> right so now this is linked to my profession there could be second other situations also i go to more store there is a scheme and i win a car there but that is not arising from my business or profession there it is not connected to my business or profession so now that may be taxable under some other provision but there is no applicability of 194r for that that may be taxable as lottery winning under other sources but it is not something which is arising from my business or profession so the link between business or profession and it is the benefit or perquisite of whom of the recipient don't look at the business of the person who is giving you have to look at the business that it has to be of the recipient so if, so all gifts given to customers will be out gift given to employees will be out so those are not covered in this because who should 
whose business or profession it should arise from business or profession of the recipient if it doesn't arise from the business or profession of the recipient resident then it is not covered under 194r it can be covered for under some other section that's a different issue but for the purpose of 194r it is outside so what you need to see is whether the recipient is into business or profession test number one second whether it arises from that business or profession if it is arise from something else then it is not covered under 194r how you track it is a difficult issue that's a different issue right so for for the person who is giving how he tracks this may be practical challenges but the interpretation is the person who receives should be into business or profession and it, it should arise from that business or profession in the sense relationship So there you are saying you are using the hotel, but they are not charging you. And when they stay, you are not charging here. So there's a sort of barter. Okay. Better would be you start charging now. If you don't charge, they will say it is taxable for them. It is taxable for you. So that is, will be a problem. It is not necessary that you should have a business relationship. The question is, is it arising from business? Now your person is going and staying there. Now, what are for what purpose they are going in staying? Is it in holiday given to them or some other thing? So if it is given as a holiday to them, then question is why did that company give holiday vouchers to employees of the other person? Okay. Now, if you give holiday to the employees, whether that becomes perquisite in the hands of those employees will be a next question. So this is linked to a lot of issues. So I'm not saying that the manufacturer and distributor should always have business relations. So the person who gives from his perspective, he may be in into business. Naturally, he will be into business. Otherwise, 194R per se will not be applicable. The person who receives for him, there should be nexus. And I will say it should be proximate, not indirect. It should be direct that it should arise from business or profession of that person. If that be the case, then it will be covered within 194R. This is the test which we have to apply. The recipient, whether is engaged in business or profession, does the benefit or perquisite arise from that business or profession? If it does not arise from that business or profession, it should be outside. If it arises from that business or profession, it will be covered. Will not cover, because FAQ 4 is there, I'll come to that. FAQ 4 is there, I'll come to that. Otherwise, TDS itself is not applicable. Acha, company you are saying in, in case of an individual and HUF, right? In case of an individual HUF business is necessary because the turnover threshold will have to be breached. In case of a company, generally company is formed for the purpose of business only. Who are you? Individual not crossing threshold of 1.5 crores of turnover. So you are already in business. So if you are not in business, no, no, see the, the exception for individual or HUF is that if it doesn't cross the turnover threshold, second proviso there, 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 he is not a person who has to deduct TDS. The person responsible exclusion is individual HF not crossing the TD, uh, turnover threshold. So if you're an individual, you take a legal service from me, right? You're not liable to deduct TDS. You're not liable to deduct TDS. Now, if you are an individual who is having business or profession, but you take my service for some other purposes, then you are liable to deduct TDS. Yes, but in case of an individual HUF where they are not into business or profession or not crossing those threshold revenue threshold in those cases, they need not deduct TDS because the proviso itself gives an exception, right? Unfortunately, the proviso does not give the similar exception, which is there in case of say 194J that if you use a professional service for personal purposes, you need not deduct TDS. That kind of an exception is not given here. 
possibly it will come in some day but currently that kind of an exception is not available that is from the recipient's perspective from a recipient always you have to see whether it is arising from business or profession you have to detect okay but the question is when you when when the person who is providing it the question he has to ask is whether he is otherwise liable to deduct tds now in individual or pro, individual or in hgf he doesn't crosses the threshold of turnover then he is not liable for deduct tds then he need not deduct tds so he is not a person responsible for deducting tds so that would not be applicable in those contexts there it is possible there it is applicable yes yes there it can be applicable there could be exceptions there could be an exceptions uh, but those will be very limited cases generally these kind of benefit or perquisites will be in the context of business where you are doing sales promotion or other things charitable trust which is itself into charity will not do give something to consultant has a car or these things now see the question is whether they are giving it as a donation can you saying that donation is covered under 194r it's a very interesting question i have not thought about it but it is a something whether can you say it is a benefit or perquisite or is it a donation will you make a distinction between a benefit and perquisite and a donation so by every action of the person who is give there is some benefit arising to that person but ideally it should be kept out otherwise on a donation paid if you have to deduct tds then people will start giving stop giving donations ha so charitable trust will not arise it will not be into business or profession right point that's what that's what he is saying company giving donation to charitable trust charitable trust is not into business or profession that time it will be outside if it debit also it will cover irrelevant whether you want to claim it as a deduction that doesn't matter once you have made a payment whether you claim it as a deduction for expenditure or not the tds obligation is still there tds obligation is not dependent on deductibility of expenditure not all payments you claim deduction right tds obligation is based on the test given in this you don't decide whether it is disallowable therefore i will not deduct tds right yeah for 201 will be applicable 40a1 may may not be applicable 201 will still be applicable social influencer they are covering it i'll come to that we'll quickly go because anish will either he is happy or he is unhappy I'm very happy <laughs> uh, no i am below turnover threshold <laughs> zimbabwe dollars <laughs> okay so this this is what we have to see whether the recipient into is into business or profession or not it should arise from business or profession that also will still raise tricky questions partner partnership firm giving benefit or perquisite to partner whether partner is into business or profession is it arising for him from a business or profession or if the firm is into business or profession partner is also into business or profession so if the partnership firms provide rent free accommodation to partner or certain other benefit or perquisites to partner whether 194r will be applicable on this payment in my opinion partner per se cannot be in the engaged in the business or profession though the the his income is by deeming fiction taxable as business income because 28 taxes this income but who is engaged in the business the partnership firm is engaged in the business not the partner now this is also important because then you can't say i will apply 44 ad 44 ada to partner because there are people who are saying i'll offer only 50% of the remuneration applying 44 ad the madras high court in anand kumar's case followed by the bombay high court in uh, uh, 
the decision of Parzad, uh, Parizad's case. These two decisions have taken a view that the partner is not engaged in the business or profession and therefore they will possible to apply that uh, logic when you are looking at 194R also. Ensure that tax has to be deducted. Now, subsection 1 says ensure that tax has to be deducted. Proviso also says ensure that tax required to be deducted has been paid. Right? Now, the how can tax be discharged? It could be discharged in so and so mechanism. Possibly the cash component is sufficient to discharge TDS liability if the perquisite or benefit is in cash. We are assuming it is applied well to monetary perquisites. The cash component out of kind and cash is sufficient to cover the entire TDS. This could be one way that you have cash component, you deduct and pay it. This, the, to this extent, there is no problem. Payer crossing it up, paying out of his pocket. 195 capital A as well as FAQ 9 of the circular very clearly says that if you yourself bear it, gross it up and pay it. Because they say the amount what you are paying as tax out of your pocket is also 194R item. So to that extent, it will be covered to gross it up, pay out of your pocket. Pay gives cash to the payer to meet the TDS liability. Very difficult at a practical situation, but this could be one possible ways to say that you give me the cash, I will deduct TDS and remit it. The circular looks at it in a different context. I'll go to that. But in my opinion, these could be possible ways of doing it. Debiting TDS to the running account of the distributor dealer because you'll have running account, you'll have regular transactions and you may give something to him and out of his running debit balance, you deduct TDS and remit. I would feel that this is also possible. Pay himself pays the tax, that is the advance tax and gives the chalan to the payer. So these could be diff different ways uh, which a TDS liability under this can be discharged. Sir, question 9 discusses this particular aspect. This was the question which was asked and question 9 says that the requirement of law is that the person is providing benefit in kind to the recipient and tax is required to be detected. So there says the person has to ensure that tax required to be detected has been paid by the recipient. Such recipient would pay tax in the form of advanced tax. Now this is what they say that the such recipient would pay tax in the form of advanced tax. The tax deductor may rely on the declaration along with copy of chalan provided by the recipient confirming that tax required to be deducted as a benefit has been deposited and you will report in 24Q. So where you make a payment in kind, in those cases where there is no cash component, the circular says that the other person will remit the payment as advanced tax and that advanced tax along with the declaration you should report in 26Q. This itself is a challenging mechanism. First advanced tax he has to remit quarterly, I have to deduct TDS monthly. He may have a loss, he may have any other reasons for not uh, saying that it is taxable and he may say I will not pay the advance tax. Suppose he has a loss, he will not pay the advance tax. Plus many a times the margins are so thin, this is 10% on the gross amount, his margins may be 1 or 2%, he may say that why should I pay this much of tax. There could be situations that he gets this benefit as a distributor passes on to this retailers. So he will get the as a from the company and then pass on to retailers. So he says I have never got the benefit, I have passed on to the retailers, I will claim that as a deduction and you don't tax anything in my hand. But the way circular interprets it, company gives to distributor, deduct TDS, distributor gives to retailer, distributor again deduct TDS. So in a supply chain, everyone is possibly liable to deduct TDS, they want to track it. But in the process of tracking it, this TDS amount will become high. It will become cumulative. It will become cumulative. As I said in the beginning, they have not amended 197. Ideally, they should have amended 197. And in those cases, the SSC should have gone and said that give me lower deduction certificate. But being there is no amendment in 197, no lower deduction certificate is at least possible this year. Maybe next budget they get enlightenment and amend it. Then to that extent, it is possible. Uh, PAN not available, 206AA. Return not filed, 206AB. All those will be applicable. But in most of these cases, PAN not available situation may not arise because the other person should be into the business and most probably he will have his GST numbers, what kind of transactions we are looking. There could be situations PAN is not available, but I would say in most cases PAN will be available because you would have a GST number of the other person. If PAN is not available, your 206AA, 206AB return not filed, all those provisions equally applicable, equally applicable. Whatever, 20%, whatever, double the rate, uh, for because of 206AB, yes, uh, if you pay out of your pocket, further gross up. <laughs> so, so possible, all that is possible. So this is what they are trying to say, 
with the phrase ensure that tax has to be deducted or tax required to be deducted has been paid. This is the way the board has interpreted. One clarification would have been very helpful that if there is a running debit balance, you use that running debit balance and discharge the TDS. This, this FAQ does not clarify that in my opinion, that should be something which is possible. Valuation, they say we will adopt fair market value. Again, the question was whether the power given under 194 R3 was to remove difficulty, whether they can prescribe valuation in this. That will be a question, but for our purposes, they are saying two things. If the person is purchasing the purchase cost, if the person is manufacturing such item of benefit or perquisite, in those cases, the price it charges it to its customer will be the value for the purpose of detecting TDS. Suppose I'm a car manufacturer Toyota, I give it to my dealers, dealer give it to end customers. Its customer, what I charge to my customer becomes the value on which I will deduct TDS. If I'm purchasing, so I purchase certain items, gold coins, that purchase cost will become value. In other cases, fair market value should be adopted. They have not talked here of service providers, but the logic, what is there in these two clauses should ideally extend to service providers also. So same logic should be extended to service provider also, uh, at least the item to manufacture. So there could be service providers to whom you want to extend this particular benefit. The recipient for the recipient now here, well, let me finish to the recipient, whether same value will become taxable income, whether the same value will be taxable income will be a question that is unanswered because this is a value for deducting TDS, whether that necessarily that value is the recipient's income is a question which is cannot be answered by virtue of this particular circular. For him, the value on which he pays income will be different. And given that the circular is not binding to him, he can challenge it. For example, if there is a particular conference and out of that, there is a leisure component of gala dinner, which includes dine and wine. People like me who even think twice before drinking a soft drink, will not take those wine and dine. He will say it is not a benefit for me. Whereas the company will say, I have to deduct TDS for every person. I will deduct TDS on every person. So there could be this difference between what is value for 194 R purpose, 28 for purpose. That challenge will remain. That challenge will remain. Yeah. 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 No, possibly the next question will answer, uh, next uh, slide will answer this, that where these kind of things are there, discount, rebates, free samples, cash discount. No, differential pricing also, you are given the differential pricing because of certain parameters, right? You are saying that the same item, I am selling it to my sister concern at 100 rupees, you are selling it to me at 120 rupees, right? So that is a lesser realization of sale price. That is a lesser realization of sale price. The recipient is also accounting 100 rupees as his purchase price and claiming it as a deduction. It will not be covered in 194R. This particular question will indirectly answer your query. So they, they said that what happens to sales discount, cash discount, rebates, whether they are benefit and perquisite. What the circular says is, first it says it is benefit or perquisite. But then to remove difficulty, we will not, uh, there is no requirement to TDS. They did not concede that it is not benefit or circular, benefit or perquisite. Idly, it is not a benefit or perquisite because the discussion in such section, uh, question four, first paragraph itself says it is a lesser realization of sale price. When it is a lesser realization of sale price, how can it be a benefit or perquisite? Okay. Then they also talk of giving items free. So 10 plus two items you are giving. So for these items or the similar items, in those cases, there is no, Five minutes I will try to wind up. So in those cases, there will be no tedious obligations. However, they go on further to say these items, there will be tedious obligations, which are incentives in the form of cash or kind car, TV, etc. Person sponsoring a trip, free ticket of an event. Last one is dangerous, free samples given to medical practitioners. If you give free sample to medical practitioners, they say it is a benefit or perquisite under the MCI guidelines, Medical Council of India guidelines, free samples cannot be used by doctors. They have to give it to patients. 
So how can it be a benefit or perquisite to doctors? There is a specific guidelines given that how we'll use those free samples. But unfortunately, the circular says that this will become benefit or perquisites. They go on further to say that the pharma company may give free samples to doctors who are employee of the hospital. So on whose benefit or perquisite it is? Should you deduct for doctors or you deduct for hospital? They say the doctors have got the free samples because they are employee of the hospital. Therefore, it is hospitals benefit or perquisite because they knew if they say doctor benefit or perquisites, doctors are employees. They are not arising in the course of business. Therefore, 194R would not be applicable. Therefore, they took it to the level of hospital. 20,000 threshold calculated the level of hospitals. It is being very difficult to track it. At the level of hospital, deduct TDS. Then when hospital gives this to doctor, they say it becomes perquisite, employee perquisite. You deduct TDS again as an employee perquisite. Whether employee, when he gives to patient, he will get deduction. He will not get deduction. There is no provision to get him deduction. But when he, when you give to consultant doctor, consulting doctor who is not an employee, in those cases, they say deduct TDS directly in the name of consultant. No need to deduct in the name of hospital. Possibly the consultant, when he gives it to patient, will have to claim the deduction for free sample given to the patients. Unfortunate clarification. As I said, they are to remove difficulties. Whose difficulty they removed, I don't know. They are giving benefit of perquisites to consultants. Because more litigation will come because of this. Right. So this is what has been clarified. We have very little time. We'll just quickly wrap it up. Social media influencer, two provisions have been given. I'll just finish it. Two guidelines have been given. You give it to them. If they give you back, then it is not benefit or perquisite. If they retain it, benefit or perquisites. This is also a nightmare. You look at the items. They say what items? Mobile, car, outfit, cosmetics. Who will give cosmetics back? Once you opened it, will you give the cosmetics back? Outfit, will you give it back? Car is understandable, mobile is understandable, but cosmetics, whether you will give back. But anyway, this is what the clarification says. The rational is this. If he gets, he gives back, then it is not perquisite. When he gives back, left open. You give at the end of economic life of that cosmetic or end of life of that car, it is not perquisite. Okay. This is on the social media. Reimbursements. Reimbursement is another nightmare which is there out of this. The logic, I'll just explain it quickly. Because one, there's a, he has already informed that we have to go up for the high tea. And Hanish, I cannot give more benefit and perquisite to Hanish. So the reimbursement, they have laid down the principle that reimbursement, first point, point number one, reimbursement is a benefit or perquisite. Okay. If reimbursement, they give example of a professional only, professional like me, I have to go and argue a case in say Mumbai. Okay. If I incur that flight ticket charges, the hotel charges, if the bill is in my name and he reimburses me, the company reimburses me, then it is benefit or perquisites. If it's the bill is in the name of company and he pays it, it was his obligation, he has discharged, it is not benefit or perquisites. Again, not required. Already people are deducting 194J on these items. And how can reimbursement be a benefit or perquisite? This is an expense incurred for the purpose of rendering that services or for the purpose of business or profession. How can that be a and reimbursement cost to cost? I've incurred 100, got back 100. Where is the question of benefit or perquisite? They've completely lost sight of what do you mean by benefit or perquisite. I said in the beginning, after reading circular, I can confirm that I don't know what is benefit or perquisite. Okay, so this is on the reimbursements. Dealer conference, they say, you look at this again explanation, the expenditure pertaining to dealer conference would not be considered as benefit or perquisites if it is held with the prime, obje prime object to educate dealers with so-and-so, new product launch discussion on the product so-and-so. Till now, no problem. However, conference must not be in the nature of incentive benefit to select dealers or customers who have achieved particular targets. So if it is a dealer conference for select dealers, top 100 dealers come, not covered in the circular. It becomes benefit of purposes. This is what the officer is going to do. Okay. So if you call someone, it is natural for me that I'll call my top distributors to discuss the business strategy. I will not come and call my bottom distributors to discuss my strategy. Why will I call them? But they say if you call select people, 
then it is benefit or perquisite. No doubt they may come and discuss only the business things which are there in the first items. Look at further. However, further following cases of expenditure would be considered as benefit of perquisite, will be considered. Expenses attributable to leisure trip or leisure component, even if it is incidental to dealer business or conference. So you have dealer conference at five o'clock you serve or eight o'clock you serve a gala dinner, wine and dine. It becomes benefit of perquisite. How you bifurcate it? Don't know. You have a conference in Pondicherry along with room rent, the hotel gives you free spa, that free spa is benefit of perquisite. How you bifurcate it? I don't know. Okay. So the way the circular has gone about is going to create problems in these cases. Look at the second items, family, family members, understandable. If you take family members, it is there. Third one, expenditure incurred on participation of dealers business conference for days which are on account of prior stay or overstay beyond the date of such. So you should come at morning 10 o'clock only. If you come prior to that, because there is no flight or train to that particular location, it is benefit or perquisite. You, you, once the conference get over at five o'clock, you should immediately leave. If you don't have train, go walking. But if you stay overnight, it becomes benefit of perquisite. Very unfortunate, laughable, exp laughable clarifications. As I said in the beginning, this is one which will force people to change the way they do business. And that cannot be an objective of an income tax law that you force someone to change the way they business. These are clarifications. As I said, they didn't have power to provide these kind of clarifications, which go much beyond the scope of 194R1. We'll have to be challenged at some level. Bring it to a logical conclusion. Second item, family members you take along with it, understandable, tax it but not for item one or you call your select this. I as a businessman will decide which distributor I want to bring into for the discussion purposes. The government cannot say you bring all distributors in India or a particular region. So I'll close with this. There are many more issues we can discuss for the entire day. Credit card points, whether it can be a loan waiver, notional interest, and a lot of other things can come within the uh, ambit of this. It is so wide there. All of us are still learning on this. Um, thank you for patient hearing. Any questions? Maybe we are not possible to take now. Maybe next time. Right? Thank you. This is one of the speakers, uh, Naveen sir, K, uh, KS Naveen Kumar. And we had to speak on a session and there were five participants. I was a little disappointed saying that, sir, we have prepared so much from last three days we are discussing. There are only five participants. He said one very nice thing, which whenever there are less parts, you know, because I think there's a very less crowd for uh, Narendra sir caliber speaker and the topic also. So he, he gave a very nice, um, you know, uh, version to this. He said, when uh, <clears throat> uh, Arjuna was listening to Bhagavad Gita from Krishna, there was only one speaker, there was only one participant. So any, nothing can be greater than Gita. But the point is, at that point of time, Arjuna had 100% concentration. Here we have mobiles to disturb ourselves. That is one issue. Okay, so we'll try to overcome that issue. Before that, I think... Uh, okay, we'll continue. Whenever sir says uh, uh, us to stop for a minute, we'll stop. Okay. So, I don't know much about income tax. I have not much idea about income tax at all. What I know is a little bit of GST. And I have read 194R thanks to Narendra sir's input, whatever he has given to me. And I've tried to add my whatever views are there on GST on what will be the implications when one section, section 194 R deductions are made for the vendor or the supplier. Okay. So bear with me if my responses to the 194 R implications are wrong, I will, I would definitely be open to corrections. But as far as GST is concerned, I have a reason why there is a view and I would be more than happy to listen to your views. Okay. First is relevant provisions. I know people who are from income tax background will have no idea about this because when 206, 201, 41, 28, 5 are being discussed, I was equally clueless. Okay. So section 9, subsection 1 is the charging section for GST. It says there shall be levied a tax on supply of goods and services. Like we have income under income tax law. We have supply under the GST law. Okay. Section 71A defines the term supply to be supply 
for consideration in the course of business. Like 194R says it should be arising in the course of business or profession. Section 71A also says supply can be for consideration, but it should be in the course of business. If it is not in the course of business, it cannot be treated as a supply. Then we also have 71C, which says <clears throat> whether it is supply, not a supply, whether it is in course of business or not in the course of business, whether there is consideration or no consideration, as long as in schedule when it finds an entry or required to pay tax on the same, right? There's a deemed provision. <clears throat> there we observe serial number one to schedule one, permanent transfer disposal of business asset. Now, what is business asset has not been defined in the GST law. Only capital asset has been defined. But what serial number one says is that permanent transfer disposal of business asset on which ITC has been claimed. Okay, so I have, I have a laptop. I donate it to an NGO. I have not sold it to an NGO. I have donated to an NGO. If I have availed input tax credit on the same, I am required to pay tax on this donation because schedule one says I am not bothered whether you have given consideration or not. Okay. Then we have section 17.5 H, very interesting provision, goods lost. Goods is very important term here. The word does not, the, the provision does not cover services. Okay. It covers only goods lost, stolen, destroyed, written off, or disposed of by way of gift or free sample. Now I would like uh, to draw your attention to the word disposal. And before we go to the word disposal, let's see in what company this word disposal is. It is in the company of lost. It is in the company of stolen. It is in the company of destroyed, written off. All these are activities for something which I don't want to do intentionally. It has just happened. Okay, so disposed of by way of gift, one doubt which arises is when I say disposed of by way of gift, I don't dispose of something by way of a gift. I dispose it because I don't want it. Correct. So one interpretation here is when I give it as a gift, it is not disposal by way of a gift. It is a gift. Whether reversal is required or required or output tax is required to be paid or not, we'll discuss a little later. But if you're looking at section 17, 5H and we are talking about disposal of goods. One of the views available, though we don't have any judgments on this, is that disposal disposed of is in the company of such words that when I voluntarily give a gift, 17.5H will not get attracted. It will come into picture only if there is some goods which is not usable. Uh, example, with uh, Times of India, we'll get uh, 10 milliliter of shampoo. Oh, Manita has got a lot of shampoos, so she can relate to that example. Or tester deos or perfumes or, or uh, pharmaceutical samples which says not for retail sale. Those are disposed of. But something which can be sold cannot be disposed of is one of the arguments which is possible to come out of the ambit of 17.5H and say I will not reverse the input tax credit. Okay. Now let's go to section 194R a little bit, sir, I'm sorry. <clears throat> it is effective from 1st July 2022, so already effective. Okay. Requires TDS to be deducted at the rate of 10%. And I have to see from a recipient's angle, that was the argument what Mohit and a few of our friends were trying to make. From a recipient's angle, I have to see whether he is in the course of business or not. Okay. And only then 10% TDS will come into picture. But when we are talking about GST, I am not bothered about the recipient. I am bothered about the supplier. So from, we can observe that 194R has a different playground to play and GST has a totally different playground or field to play. Okay, because TDS is from recipient's angle and supply is from supplier's angle, not from the recipient's angle. Okay, now <clears throat> my question, I have few questions. I don't have any answers at all. I have only questions today. Okay. Can deduction of TDS under section 194R trigger supply under GST? Just because somebody has deducted TDS under 194R and is appearing in my 26 AS, can it be said that it is a supply under GST? So pay GST on the same. I'll pause for a minute. Yeah. Firstly, apologies to come in between you when you have an excellent session going on. Of course, um, I just wanted to thank Mr. Narendra Jain, who took his time and effort and agreed to come here. Also, he has a last moment travel plan. So I just wanted to 
take this time out. I request our chairman of Bangalore branch to hand him a to token of uh, uh, appreciation as a mark of gratitude and respect. Thank you, sir. Can you please over to you? Apologies from my end. I have not forgotten my question. <clears throat> if uh, somebody deducts 194R TDS, okay, is the person on whom this TDS is deducted is required to admit that as a supply and pay GST or not? Is my question. Let's take a question, a proper perspective, okay? So, <clears throat> uh, Nikhil is a dear friend, okay? So, Nikhil is a distributor of one of the product. He has been able to achieve 10 lakh unit sales in a quarter. And the scheme document says, if any dealer crosses 10 lakh units, he is eligible to get a gold coin. Okay. He has been given gold coin. 10 minutes back, whatever session we had, I believe that 194R is applicable on issuance of gold coin by the OEM to the distributor. Now, in 26 AS of Nikhil, there is a gold coin which has been assigned a value and TDS at the rate of 10% has been deducted on the same. Right? Now, is Nikhil required to pay GST on the same or not? On this gold coin or not? It is bound on the recipient only, no? Correct. Ah, so we are out of 194R now. Before Rava Idli was 194R. After Rava Idli is going home. So we are in post session. Correct, no? No, 194R is applicable. My point is because of income tax knowledge or because of GST knowledge? Income tax knowledge. Not useful. Sorry, ah, all company distributor. The end consumer will be you only. No, 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 no. Very simple. Your OEM, your he is distributor. You have launched the scheme. Whom he is selling to, we are not bothered. You told him ten lakh units. You sell. He has sold. You gave gold coin. That's all. Is the transaction. Hmm. Mm. You are not end customer, you are not consuming, no? your wife is not going to wear that, no? Multiple times. Mm. No, we are not talking from your perspective. We are talking from his perspective. The question is whether he should pay GST or not. Right. So your point is that he is not a supplier at all. Correct. No, is your point. Very nice. Supply triggers. Nikhil has to pay tax for the service which he has rendered to Mohit. We don't know what service. He has received consideration in the form of gold coin. Correct. Right, sir. Okay. Not okay. 194 hour only we did not understand. Now what, what is this he is talking about now next level. Right. We'll examine this, sir. No worries at all. Okay. Now, if, sir, you say it is taxable, what happens to all these transactions where 194R was not there before 1st July 2022 and you have not paid tax on the same? Still, it is a supply. You will have to pay tax now. Because now, officer will say, sir, please show your 194R deductions. Have you paid tax? Yes, sir. I've paid. On all the gold coins I have received, I have paid the tax. Okay. And it is not that he has sold gold coin. He is getting gold coin in consideration. Rate of tax will be 18% only. It will not be gold coin rate of 3%. Okay. Now, officer, very good. You have paid, no? What happened to earlier transaction? Have you crossed 10 lakh units anytime? Sir, every time I'm best dealer in Bangalore award. So I got car, I got gold, I got mobile phone, everything I've got. Have you paid tax on that? 
over no so this could be one of the issues if we say and i'm not concluding anything here because i don't know much about this but if we say this is a supply for which consideration is being issued in the form of gold coin okay then even the past will open up that is one of the issue we have to be mindful of there i have another example now okay virat kohli assuming scores 100 nowadays he's not been scoring that's why i said assuming okay so virat kohli scores 100 okay in rcb still rcb will lose okay rcb scores 100 uh, sorry virat kohli scores 100 rcb pays him the match fee he becomes man of the match bcci pays him 1 crore i think we have discussed this mr hari right so 1 crore bcci pays him as man of the match is virat kohli required to pay gst on this or not income tax i have no idea G gst is he required to pay or not yes he is required to pay whether 194r will apply in this case or not when bcci gives him okay so there is a confusion whether given in cash 194r will apply or not so assuming bcci does not give him cash it gives 1 crore worth of car to man of the match is 194r applicable sorry is there okay specifically for uh, winning okay now my point is whether it is liable to gst or not whether that car is liable to GST or not. So any, any bank transaction credit in the bank statement liable to GST. See GST says there has to be a supply for consideration in the course of business. What is the supply Virat Kohli has done to BCCI? Nothing. He has a contract with RCB, whether duck out or two zeros before one, he will get the same match fees only. Next auction, his zero will reduce, one of the zeros, correct? So his contract was with RCB. For that, he has to pay GST, correct? But he never had a contract with BCCI. BCCI says, if you perform well, I will give you, correct? None of the match. Last minute, BCCI, I will not give you. Still, Virat Kohli cannot file a case against BCCI. Correct. Or Virat Kohli cannot file a case against BCCI. I scored 100, he scored only 50. Why you gave him man of the match? Why you did not give him man of the match? Nothing. It is voluntary, uh, what do you say, act by BCCI to honor some player or not to honor some player. So I would believe it is liable to income tax. If 194BB is not there, 194R would have got triggered. But still it may not be liable to GST is my view. Okay. Now Mr. Yash finishes KGF2 shooting. How many crores it collected? Some thousand crore, or thousand two hundred crore. I don't know. So the producer, he was only a producer, but assuming he is not the producer, the producer gave him a car. Is that liable to GST? Is that liable to 194R? First of all, arising out of his profession. Correct. No. So 194R will apply. Whether GST is applicable, Mr. Rajat? Yes. I still believe there is no contract between the producer and the actor to get that car. It is out of love and affection of the producer on the actor that he has got that car. Correct, no? So the point I'm trying to drive here is merely because there is 194R does not mean it will trigger a supply under the GST law. Only because somebody has deducted 194R TDS that does not mean I have to admit GST under the GST law. That is what I was trying to bring theoretically. This is all theoretically we are talking theoretically practically what we should do we'll discuss in the subsequent slide. so theoretically just because there is a 194 r does not mean there is a gst implication right okay another issue just i want to just by the way cover there is one of the faqs which says that if you are giving the gift in kind then how will you deduct tds so you pay tds from your own resources and gross it up the value of the purpose it will be grossed up in gst if you gross up on that grossed up amount, you will have to pay the GST. Okay, so that is one more issue which will uh, come up when you decide to pay GST or not. Okay, now basis this background, let's look at certain situations and see how GST will play in each of these cases. Okay, I will require full support from you. Okay, so please be with me, please bear with me and please try to give me answers as far as income tax is concerned and few of our friends are there who can help me out with the 
GST answers as well. Okay. So we we first talk about transactions between employer and employee. Okay. Clearly, 194R is not applicable when there is an employer-employee transaction because it has to arise in the course of business or profession. Correct? So whether it is given to employee as part of the employment contract or as a Diwali gift, less than 50,000 or more than 50,000 or given by way of cash, 194R will not get attracted. Something else, 192 might get attracted. Right? But 194R will not get attracted. Is my understanding right? So in all these cases, can I say... 194R not applicable. Hmm? As far as 194R is saying, R is not applicable. Okay. So now we have if perquisite is given to the employee and if it forms part of the employment contract, then we have a latest fresh circular, circular 172 of 2022, which says any perquisite given to the employee as part of the employment contract will be covered under schedule 3 employee to employer in the course of employment no need to pay gst on the same okay not forming part of the employment contract like diwali gift i will give you diwali gift i will never say that in the contract i will give it based on the profit okay so if that gift is less than 50000 rupees again there is no tax implication under the gst law but if the gift is more than 50000 rupees then as per schedule 1 though it is gift but because it's a transaction between related parties, employer and employer related, how much ever you hate your boss or the employee, you're related to each other in GST, right? So you were required to pay tax on the same if the value is more than 50,000 rupees. And if it is anything other than that given to the employee, still from the GST perspective, because of schedule one, it will be liable to tax, but 194R will not come into picture, right? This is as far as employer and employee is concerned, which is out of the ambit of 194R. Now, Heading Mohit, because that's what the debate was. Transaction between vendor and not customer. Customer will never come into picture. Vendor and distributor, wholesaler, retailer, only those guys will come into picture. Customer will not come into picture, right? Okay. Now let's analyze few of the situations and you will have to help me out 194R also and input output for both the people because both the angles we'll have to look at, correct? No, from recipient's angle also, supplier's angle also. Let's, uh, let's look at that. Samples given by Mr. Mohit, who is a OEM, to Mr. Nikhil, who is a distributor. 194R, applicable, not applicable? Applicable, sample. Applicable, Q4. Question number 4 of the FAQ clearly says for me, I don't have to read the provision, FAQ is very simple. So question number 4 of the FAQs of Circular 12 of 2022 clearly says, samples given, 194R will be applicable. Okay. Now look at it from OEM or vendor's angle. Vendor has manufactured those samples or purchased those samples. Can he claim input credit? No, on the samples, no. Why? Disposed of by way of gift or free sample, section 17.5H, I will not be entitled to claim the credit. Correct? So I will reverse the input credit. Whatever I distribute a sample, I will not take the credit. Because I am not taking the credit, now, I don't have to pay output tax also because I have not received money for that. I have given it free. And now Nikhil's book, he has got the sample, but nobody has charged him tax. Can he claim input credit? No, he cannot. Now he wants to dispose of sample. Sample by very nature cannot be disposed of. He has to consume it. Correct. So output tax also will not be applicable. Clear? That is option number one. Now let's look at option number two, which a lot of companies are actually doing. Okay. 194R will not have any implication, but in GST, I will avail this ITC. Okay. Once I avail the ITC, the sample is a business asset. Schedule one says permanent transfer or disposal of business asset on which input tax credit has been claimed. If you give it to somebody, it will become taxable. Correct. So under schedule one, I will pay the tax. So Mohit will pay the tax for samples given to Nikhil. From government's angle, they either get output tax or reversal of input tax. For government, they have received the money. Now, in the hands of Nikhil, can Nikhil claim the credit? Mohit has raised the invoice under Schedule 1 and he has given the invoice to Nikhil. Question is whether Nikhil can claim the credit or not. No? Sorry, use for personal business, sir. 
business consideration was not there. So I have to make the payment within 180 days. I will not be able to make the payment within 180 days. So I cannot take the credit. There is exception to rule 37, which says schedule one transaction means there is no consideration. When there is no consideration, no need to pay that consideration within 180 days. So if your argument was that consideration was not paid within 180 days, so I cannot take the credit, proviso to 37 will help. That means you can take the credit. Correct, no? Any other argument? No? That means all conditions satisfied. Value, he will assign. No, no, if he issues the invoice, he has to pay tax. There is no doubt about it. He has to pay tax. If he issues the invoice, uploads it, come, appears in GST way. No other credit is appearing. Genuine credit is not appearing. Only his credit is appearing. He can take? Okay. So he will take the credit. And if he disposes of or personally uses, he will not pay output tax. Meaning he is consuming it, not personally consuming it. He is consuming it for his purpose of business, no output tax. But if he resells it, he will have to pay the output tax. Right? Okay. Buy one, get another. We are not talking about shoes. It has to come in pairs only. Buy one soap, get another soap free. 194R, clear FAQ, which says Q4 only, that it is not liable to 194R. It is as good as 10 plus 2, it is as good as 12 bought at the price of 10. That is what the example says. So it says 194R is not applicable. Now luckily even in GST we have a circular which says that buy one get one that another one is not being issued free you cannot go to the shopkeeper and say why are they to buy one get one man oh get one wala de do buy one wala mein ko nahi chahiye you cannot say that correct it is a composite supply or a mixed supply right depending on what the product is involved so there'll be no additional liability there'll be no additional credit there'll be no additional output tax as far as gst is concerned quantity discount Take more than 1 lakh units, I will give you 2% extra at the end of the quarter as discount. <clears throat> uh, question 4 of the FAQs, that is 12 of 2022 in income tax, surprisingly says, this is also a benefit. But it may cause some difficulty. So forget it. 194 are not applicable. If cause a difficulty, some provision was not applicable, then income tax only should not apply. And same holds good for GST also. Correct, no? Luckily, even in GST, we have a circular which says if you issue the credit note before September and all the conditions are satisfied, a credit note can be issued for this quantity discount, which means you will reduce the output tax as a vendor and the recipient will reduce the input tax credit because earlier something was offered to you at 10 rupees. Now the effective price has become 9. Moet is claiming deduction from the government of 1 rupee, saying that I have paid extra tax. But this tax was already given as credit to Nikhil. The deduction will be given to Mohit for that 1 rupee extra only if Nikhil reverses the credit. Right? Now, secondary discount. Now, what is secondary discount? Section 15.3 has some conditions to be satisfied. Only then discount can be allowed as a deduction for the purpose of GST. If those conditions are not satisfied, one of the condition is that the discount should have been communicated before the sale happens. So here if the discount is not communicated before the sale happens, then this credit note cannot be issued under the GST law. But accounts does not restrict us from issuing debit note and credit note. So what you will issue is a financial credit note. When Mohit issues a financial credit note, no impact on GST, so no output tax grades reduced. So Nikhil is also not required to reverse any input tax credit. Right? Okay. Business conferences not to select dealers he is not under 194 R and I will also be able to avail the credit. Okay, because it's a business conference. Unless the HSN code of the conference is food, then you'll get blocked under section 17 subsection 5. Correct. So I will smartly get a bill with HSN of event management charges or bankway charges and claim the full credit. Correct. No, that's the advantage of not having an online webinar. We can discuss tax planning also, right? Okay. Now we go to sales promotion schemes. Okay. Now, assuming uh, Mohit announces some scheme where they say you reach 1 lakh units, 5 lakh units, 10 lakh units, I will give you a mobile phone, I will give you a gold coin, etc. Okay. Option under 194R, is it applicable? Yes, it is applicable. Now, what can Mohit do? Very simple, what we discussed earlier also. 
he will reverse the credit because gift or sample disposed of by way of gift or disposed of by way of sample now look at this the income tax authorities are going to check 194r in the hands of mohit okay the gst authorities are going to check 194r in the hands of nikhil and then they will say this 194r deduction is a income under the income tax law you have offered that to tax under business income gst is applicable on supply of goods or services everything is either goods or service correct either it is goods if it is not goods service means anything please pay the tax in service tax itself they are saying the same thing all of us have got notices for 26 as not matching with service tax returns including my own form all of us have got correct no so 194r who will stop gst authorities from issuing notice they will say anything you have done something you have done no correct you have offered that to tax under income tax law please pay gst on the same so if i follow option number one where the vendor reverses the credit in the hands of nikhil 18 percent tax plus interest and penalty will become the cost correct so when mohit on first july 2022 sent a mail to nikhil from tomorrow whatever gold coin you are eligible to i will deduct tds under 194r what should nikhil say sir whenever you tell me that i am eligible for gold coin no please send an email to me that i am eligible what i will do i will raise an invoice for services correct i will raise an invoice for services right you claim the credit of that 18 percent otherwise i will have to pay from my pocket no so you claim the credit of that services now because you have booked it as services deduct tds under 194j or 194c whatever the section is our friends are champions shubhash will help us in finding out which is the section now the moment there is one section under which tds has already been deducted i am not sure if another section can come and say tds is applicable here also at least if rate is same nothing will happen if the 194c and j then no you had to deduct it 10 you have deducted it to eight percent short deduction something like that. in default something will come correct no that i am not uh, aware of but my point is now you have hijacked the transaction it is no longer a benefit it is a service contract for which you have received the consideration in the form of gold coin where is it a benefit benefit is when something is given to you without any quid pro quo here you have established that you have given a service to him correct for which you are supposed to get uh, 57000 rupees what is the gold rate today 58000 rupees you got the 58000 rupees by gold coin that's all nothing else right now mohit will purchase the gold coin correct he will raise an invoice on nikhil that i am selling you gold coin okay can he sell anything incidental to business is also business in gst under companies act rajat will say what is to be under the object clause but under gst section 2 subsection 17 anything incidental to business is also business so gold coin is also business i can sell right so mohit will now issue a gold coin invoice to nikhil nikhil will claim input tax credit of that because that is his business asset right now the second transaction also it is only a payment for the service rendered by nikhil no 194r correct in the hands of nikhil now if he does not want to account in the company take that gold coin and go home then he will reverse the credit if this gold coin is given to the employee he will pay output tax under schedule one so depending on what he does output tax will be applicable if he sells it he got so many gold coins that he sold it right then he will have to pay output tax clear so wherever 194r comes everybody will start paying output tax that means in his 26 years there'll be no 194r correct no if you follow option one issue if you follow option two 194 r is redundant r could be reward but in our case it will become redundant clear you are able to follow okay. now trip or event tickets i am a little doubtful about this but i would try to attempt to work on this example again tickets given leisure trip given resort entry given or some event tickets sonu nigam concert is there that tickets given to the distributor who has achieved 10 lakh units okay first point 
available in the hands option number one credit is available because 17 5h is applicable only for goods this is service so credit is available no restriction okay option number two now nikhil will say oh, you have taken the credit you have uploaded my 194 r also gst department will run and come behind me so what i will do i will raise the invoice so exactly the same planning here everything remains the same only thing is i am not clear about this raise invoice for supplier services what hsn he will use if i give a trip i cannot use uh, tour operator services that is where i am getting stuck so if you have any answer please feel free to contribute otherwise i am stuck at this gold coin gold rate i can apply but tour operator services i have taken one tour from make my trip i am giving it to nikhil can i also raise the invoice of tour operator services i am getting a little stuck on that aspect sorry business support but what is the service tour operator see you are paying a higher rate of tax no problem but is that correct you are not doing anything you only bought voucher from make my trip and you are giving it to him that's all nothing else there is definitely service and there is no argument if you are ready to pay higher rate of tax my only point is is higher rate of tax payable or not is my question service only is a problem sir goods always uh, same yeah same service only is a problem okay next social media influencers okay, our friend rajat is a social media influencer anything he post minimum 5000 views 4000 from his fake accounts and 1000 genuine okay so now because he is a social media influencer he has got car mobile outfit cosmetic all of it we are talking about product retained if it is returned there is no 194r applicable if it is returned then there is no gst implication also only when it is retained then 194r question number 6 clearly says that uh, tds is required to be deducted now here also same aspect reverse the credit whoever is issuing the cosmetics to rajat or he's they're giving outfits to rajat they will have to reverse the credit because disposed of by way of gift okay option number 2 rajat will now raise a invoice saying i am marketing your products on instagram whenever i wear it people uh, don't be, buy it sorry sorry buy it okay so i am promoting your product correct so i will raise a invoice on you the company can claim the credit because it is in relation to their business promotion okay so again it will not be 194 r it will become 194 j or some other relevant section i'm sorry uh, if my uh, 194 r or income tax implication is completely wrong it will be 194 j or 194 c or whatever section is there okay now whatever gift has been given or the product has been given to mr rajat the company anyways is dealing in those products only so they will raise a invoice on him that i sold cosmetics to him i sold out, uh, outfits to him okay rajat can claim the credit because he is earning money out of google ads he is earning money because of his instagram followers so all the outfits what he has purchased he is used for the purpose of business only there can be no personal consumption here okay so again this output is in the kind is a payment for the supply rendered by rajat so 194r will not come there as well in, on the both the considerations okay and of course if rajat disposes of that outfit he will have to pay output tax otherwise there is no need to pay output tax okay as far as services is concerned i have uh, uh, intentionally take taken restaurant services because 194 r will come into picture but as far as vendor is concerned can he claim the credit if he is under 5% scheme he cannot take the credit because 5% is without atc if he is under 18% scheme if it is dilla palace or lalit ashok they will be able to claim the credit even if food is offered to mr rajat free of cost okay option number 2 rajat will raise a invoice that i am a food blogger i will upload the comments and people will come and visit your restaurant so I, that is the service i have rendered the company will claim the credit depending on whether they are at 5% or 18% 5% they will not get the credit 18% they will get the credit then now the restaurant will raise a invoice on mr rajat saying i have supplied food to you here the issue will be in the hands of rajat because it is food though used for the purpose of outward supply but that outward supply does not include food so it will be blocked in his hands okay so that is one issue in restaurant services i have found where the credit free flow will not be there okay then we come to reimbursement of expenses quite complex the entire faq has totally confused all of us with what is reimbursement now okay so yeah
Hmm. I would think, do you think it is right? Okay. Now what I will do is, instead of accounting that as an expense, I will have a separate invoice for that expense. Now earlier business promotion was gold. Now gold is sitting in sales. Business promotion is Rajat's expense. Correct? No. See earlier your business promotion was what? Gold coin. Now purchase there is gold coin, sale there is gold coin. Netted off. What is your expense now? Invoice of Rajat. Apart from so many other invoices. That's why I'm saying there can be no 194 hour at all. No, the moment I account it, that means it is a contract based on which I am accounting an income. He will not accept my invoice. Correct. So that means I put in some efforts to get that gold coin. So I am monetizing that efforts by rendering the service for which I am raising an invoice. My only point there is I am not even commenting on gold coin now. I have to comment on invoice of Rajat. That okay, out of 100 people, Rajat is also one of the person who is promoting my product. I I am, I think this is a 194R cannot exist when there is no benefit. And if there is a contract which says I will give you this, you give me this, there can be no benefit. If there is, then every sale is a 194R only. Oh, there is, if you achieve 10 lakh units, can you file a case against the other person if he does not give you what he promised you? Contract, no? I am auditor, I did not get money from Mantri, they gave me an apartment. So what is it now, perquisite or fees? I am auditor of Mantri, they did not pay me the fees. I took apartment number 101 from them. Is it perquisite or fees? That's all, no? That's what? No, no, same example. Your point was, now your point was that I am selling gold coin, I cannot get car. Why I cannot? If that guy is not able to pay me, I will recover whatever is there with him. Now transporter, transporter raised a bill of 1 lakh rupees. The other guy is not able to pay. Took his goods only and kept it in my godown. Consideration can be in money or in the form of any other form, valuable consideration, that's all. No, no, if you don't do this, 100% 194R is there. If you do this, there is a chance of saying 194R may not apply. If you fall op under option 1, 100% 194R is applicable. Correct, no? If you move to option number two, there might be a possibility that 194R is written. I know I'm walking on a very thin ice. I don't even know answer of GST. I'm commenting about income tax. I know I'm aware of that, but I'm just saying from GST also you'll be covered and from income tax also you will be covered. Yeah. Now let's look at reimbursement. What does the FAQ say? 
properly confuse all of us. Okay. It says liability of one person met by another person. The initial part of FAQ, which I was able to understand. Liability of A met by B. Okay, that is a perquisite or an incentive on that question number 7 says 194R will apply. Also, section 15.2B of the CGST Act says that when somebody is required to incur expenditure as a supplier, but the recipient incurs that expenditure, okay, if that expenditure is not added to the value, then 15.2B says it will be deemed to be added. Let's take an example here, okay. Assuming I am a chartered accountant, no, sorry, no assumption here. Okay, I am a chartered accountant. The contract with my client is, I will get you a refund of 1 crore. My fees is 1 lakh. I have to go to customs, but the fees is all inclusive. I will not charge you cab charges, this charge, nothing. All 1 lakh rupees I will charge you. All inclusive. Okay, whenever refund comes. One of the days, the client and I had to go together. So he paid the bill which I had to incur. I had told all the captures also mine. One of the days the employee came and he paid the bill. Now I have two options. I will raise an invoice of 1 lakh. How will the client pay me? Debit note of 5000, fees of 95000. Okay. In that case GST is applicable on 1 lakh only. Second option. Anyways I had to incur 5000 expense which I have not incurred. So I have already got my 5,000 rupees indirectly because I have not spent. So I will raise an invoice of 95,000. Now 15 2B says when your contract was inclusive, you were supposed to incur some expenditure which you have not incurred but the recipient has incurred. Then to this 95, add 5,000 and pay tax on 1 lakh rupees. So what GST is saying, whether this way or that way, pay tax on 1 lakh rupees. Right? Now the issue here is, when this is inclusive method, exclusive method, what will be the implication under 194R and also in certain other cases, what will be the implication under the GST law? That's what we will try to examine this slide. Now this contract is inclusive. That means all expenses will be borne by the supplier only. Who has paid this? The client has paid. That is the customer has paid. Invoice in the name of does not make any difference. What is the invoice in the name of the client or in the name of the consultant? Okay, 194R, is it applicable? Obligation of one person met by another person. 194R gets triggered. In case of GST, if you can demonstrate that you are a pure agent, let's take an example. You are incorporating a company and for incorporating the company, you have told the total charges are 50,000 rupees including MCA filing fees. Okay, now of that 50,000 rupees, 7,500 rupees is MCA filing fees where the invoice is in the name of the client. It may not be relevant from income tax angle. But if the chalan is in the name of the company, then you can say you are pure agent. In that case, GST will not be applicable. Correct. So that is the relevance of this pure agent example here. Okay. We already discussed that 1 lakh and 95,000. Then if the contract is exclusive, that means I will charge you 1 lakh rupees. Plus if I go 10 times, every time I go 2,000 rupees I incur. So 2,000 multiplied by 10, 20,000 rupees I am going to recover from you. If it is an exclusive of out-of-pocket expenses contract. Okay. And now it is paid by the consultant. Invoice in the name of the client. Is 194R applicable? The FAQ says if the invoice in the name of the client, then no need to pay because that is not a benefit which has been given. It's only a reimbursement. What is the logic? I have no idea at all. But that is what the FAQ says. That I know. Right? Okay. Now as far as GST is concerned, is it a pure agent? Yes, because invoice in the name of the client, not in the name of the consultant, then GST will not be applicable. But if you don't satisfy the condition of pure agent, okay, because you have availed the services, you were not authorized because there are six, seven conditions to satisfy for a pure agent. If you're not able to satisfy, then irrespective of the treatment under 194R, you will have to pay GST on the same. That's what we are all doing today whenever we are charging out of pocket expenses from the client. Okay. Now paid by the consultant, invoice is also in the name of the consultant. 194R is applicable because Q7 clarifies that I cannot be a pure agent because invoice in the name of the consultant and not in the name of the client. So GST will be applicable. Fourth criteria, paid by the client, but invoice in the name of the consultant. I don't know when it will happen, but I just thought I will put this permutation combination. Only this combination was left. I thought if instead of you asking, I will only tell, right? Invoice in the name of the consultant, Q7 says still it will be 
a benefit under 194R. I cannot be a pure agent, but the point here is in the books of the consultant, this expense will never come. And because this expense never comes in the books of the consultant, he will never charge it to the customer or the client. When he does not charge, GST question does not come into picture because GST is applicable only on the consideration collected from the client. That's all. I think that's all I have. Uh, if there is anything uh, you want me to cover from GST angle, not from income tax angle, I'll be more than happy to answer. Anything? Hmm. Hmm. Okay. In the FAQ, it, it only talks about. I thought toothbrush and toothpaste also they said. I th now, if they have covered toothbrush and toothpaste, then everything is covered, no? They have not said? Okay. Okay. Sorry, then I was reading composite and mixed supply, maybe there in the circular. I read that. Okay. I am not sure about 194 R, like I said. He prepared only for that question and came. Uh, then the sir said, I am going. So he had to ask that question. Correct, no, Mr. Hari? Right. Anything else? Okay. We can wind up the session. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone, for the patient listening. One, one minute, we will wait. I'll be sending it to the institute. Sure, sir. I'll send it. They will upload it on the uh, portal. Yeah, they generally upload all the slides. I'll, I'll anyway share it, sir. I'll do one thing. I'll just uh, share my email. So in case it's missed, you let me know, sir. I will share it with you. Small capital both works. The next clause uh, Subha should take on clause 44 of tax audit report. That time also second half, second innings I will play GST. First, you tell me as per PL account, as per income tax, as per income tax allowed as a deduction, not allowed as a deduction. Then, not, no, this year they have not given exemption, no, as of now. Hmm. This, as of now, we have to report. After this uh, 8 o'clock, if they issue, then we don't know. Till 5 o'clock, nothing was issued. So GST, Legal Metrology Act, we read, packed, unpacked, actionable claim, we read, transfer of immovable property. Hmm? Only thing which I was not reading is income tax law. Now that also we have to read. GST law, we don't have time to read now. Anything else which you think we can discuss? This renting of immobile property for residential purposes by a registered person to a registered person, full issue. If you look at the entry under RCM notification, that is quite broad. But if you look at the entry under the exemption notification, it is very narrow. So one situation I'll give you, you tell me whether RCM is applicable or not. Renting of immobile property for commercial purposes. 
it is a residential premise for commercial purposes given by a unregistered person to a registered person rcm will apply or not apply i will repeat again renting of immobile property which is residential property given for commercial purposes to a registered person rcm will apply not apply will apply because at least i was reading it as the moment renting of residential property for commercial purposes is there it is forward charge but yesterday in our office we were discussing and somebody pointed out this to me that that exemption what has been carved out is very small but what has been included in rcm is quite broad so even if a renting property for commercial purposes to a registered person will be liable to tax under reverse charge mechanism hmm. correct if it is commercial anyways forward charge correct to a registered person that registered person now another doubt in all our whatsapp groups are i am a chartered accountant i am registered i have taken personal house on rent i am uh, debiting that to my capital account in income tax should i pay under rcm or not i would believe it it is not liable because tax has to be paid only when it is a furtherance of business but the counter argument is 93 has to be tested in the hands of the supplier not in the hands of the recipient again same first slide issue in the hands of supplier it is in the course of business so pay that issue is there right that's all sir thank you very much everyone thanks a lot for your patient listening thank you hanish for the excellent session of course today we had a, a very enlightening knowledge learning sessions and of course of the recent amendments which has its both uh, interplay between indirect tax and the direct tax so i thank you once again i request our chair yeah yes that's the josh <laughs> yeah uh, I request our chairman of Bangalore branch to uh, hand over a token of appreciation as a mark of gratitude and respect. Thank you. And of course, lastly, th thanks to you for making it convenient to attend this. Of course, I know it was raining today and uh, even we were a bit jittery what would be the participation. So, of course, thank you for turning out and please do make sure that you keep coming towards it. So, physical presence gives us a lot of motivations for us to conduct such programs. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Yes, that will be put up in the...